Of all the descriptions given of God in the Bible, only one is repeated three times in a row. And that is that God is holy, holy, holy. Let's take our Bibles this morning and open them to the book of Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, we're going to be in verses 37 through 47 this morning. Acts chapter 2, let's look at verses 37 through 47 today. We are seeing here the events. Uh, Pentecost began to bear fruit. And after Peter's preaching, we read in verse 37 the following. When they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what must we do? Repent, Peter said to them, and be baptized in each of you in the name of Jesus the Messiah for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. And with many other words he testified and strongly urged them, saying, Be saved from this corrupt generation. So those who accepted his message were baptized, and that day about 3,000 people were added to them. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayers. Then fear came over everyone, and many wonders and signs were being performed through the apostles. Now all the believers were together and had everything in common. So they sold their possessions and property and distributed the proceeds to all as anyone had a need. And every day they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple complex and broke bread from house to house. They ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And every day, every day, the Lord added to them those who were being Say, let's pray. Lord, help us to hear you today. Help us, Father, to push out all of the noise of our lives and even the noise of the ministry and just hear you. And help us to see, Lord, your power and your ability and your might that you work through a people that are led and controlled by your spirit. And as we look into this very early and pure church, we pray that you would show us how we can be like them and how you, Lord, would add to our number every day. Lord, I believe you are the same God now that worked in those lives then. And I believe as you worked in those lives, you can work in ours. So I pray that you would use the message today, the word we are about to hear, that transform us into that likeness to the glory of your name. And Lord, we pray all of these things in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. We are continuing today in our series called Simple Church. And what we are doing in this series is we're taking a look at the early church and what they did, and we're looking to see what we have added to it or what we have taken away from it that we might get ourselves to the position that they were in. There's no better place for us to test ourselves to see exactly where we are at than by looking at this very earliest church that was totally led by the Spirit of God. This occurred, this church came to be through the astonishing and amazing work of God on the day of Pentecost through the preaching of the Apostle Peter. Peter got before Jews that day. They had gathered in Jerusalem from all over the world. And the Spirit worked in such a way that as he began to preach, all of them heard him in their heart language. And, Jesus, and Peter told them some very convicting things about Jesus. Namely that he was the one that was promised to take the throne of David. And he was the one that was promised to come forth as the Messiah. But the most painful truth of all was when Peter told them, you killed him. And so did you and I. The Bible says that Jesus died for sinners. We are all sinners. Therefore, we all have a hand in the death of 
Jesus. But when those people heard that that day, the Bible says they were pierced in their heart. And they cried out to Peter and the rest of the apostles there, brothers, what must we do? And Peter says you must repent and you must be baptized because of the forgiveness of your sins. You must repent. You must turn from your sin and turn to the Savior and follow him out. The very first thing being that you become baptized. And I was reading this week something that I hadn't really come across before, but baptism then and even to this day is the definitive mark of a Jew no longer following Judaism. A lot of people say that people don't really mind if Jews talk about Jesus, study the Bible about Jesus, or anything like that, but when they become baptized, everybody knows then and there that a clear break has been made. So you can only imagine these Jews and what they were facing. They had given themselves completely to Jesus. They were saved by Jesus, and they were following Jesus to the tune of 3,000 of them being baptized. 3,000 of them following Jesus. That's how this church came to be. They realized that Jesus that was crucified and Jesus that was rose again is the Jesus that would save their souls if they would repent and put faith in him and they did. So you have this new church now. 3,000 people in Jerusalem. This, this new earliest church. What is the first thing they do? It's a good question, isn't it? What did the early church do? What were they really about? What was God's chief desire for this early church? The Bible tells us. Verse 42, the first thing they did is this. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Or they devoted themselves to the apostles' doctrine. The doctrine scares some people to death, and doctrine bores other people to death. I get that. Some have even got this idea in their heads that the more doctrine we give people, the further we actually push them away from Jesus. Calls to my mind an event I'll never forget in my last pastor. I hadn't been there too long. And a young man came up to me one day and he said, uh, you know, it would be great if you could write something on what we believe. And they definitely needed it. Uh, that church was in a theological train wreck when I went there. And I thought, you know, that is a great idea. So I wrote something up on what we believe, and I decided to begin teaching it in Sunday school. And that bothered some people because some people are going to be bothered by anything. I'm not kidding you. I, I could plan a Jesus is returning soon party for Wednesday night. Somebody here would gripe about it. Like, that's just the way it goes. So people are going to gripe. But one man actually had more of a thoughtful reaction to it. And uh, he came to me, and we were talking about it, and he said, you know, the real problem I have with this is if we're teaching this in Sunday school and we have visitors come in, we're going to be there teaching doctrine while the visitors are there. I, I thought about that for a second and I, I wasn't real for sure what the point was. I mean, I thought doctrine was a good thing. So I asked him, I said, well, what should we really be teaching about this? And he said, we need to be teaching Jesus. And I said, oh, I completely agree with that. I said, we definitely need to be teaching Jesus. And Jesus is all that we need. But then I asked him this question. I said, which Jesus do you want me to teach? And the look on his face kind of indicated that I might have broken his brain. And I know that was a little hard for him to take in, but... I thought, I better get on with this before, you know, things get out of hand here. So I said, well, which Jesus do you want me to teach? Do, do we want to teach the Jesus of Mormonism? Do we want to teach the Jesus of the Jehovah's Witnesses? Do we want to teach the Jesus of Islam? Do we want to teach the Jesus of liberal Christianity? That's, he's just a man, and that's all. I said, which Jesus do you want to hear about? 
And he said, we, we need to teach the Jesus of the Bible. And I said, well, then we better be teaching the doctrine about the Jesus of the Bible from the Bible. A smile come on his face, a smile come on my face. I kid you not. We, we became best friends uh, until the day I preached his funeral. Uh, that's uh, I'll see him again in heaven. But that's the point, folks. That's why this early church was devoted to the apostles' doctrine, so devoted to the apostles' teaching. It's because we must be devoted to doctrine if we will know Christ. Doctrine is God's means of revealing himself to us. To be devoted to doctrine is to be devoted to knowing God and his will for our lives and for our ministry. We don't know him without. Now, I want to lay before you today four benefits that come from being devoted to the apostles' teaching, with the first of them being that doctrine gives us a true portrait of Jesus. The hunger of every born-again heart should be to know more of Jesus every day. John MacArthur, I read a quote from him this last week. He says he counts it as a wasted day if he doesn't learn more about God through God's word in that day. That's a great perspective to have. And this early church is here, and they have this hunger to know more and to know more and to know more of Jesus. And you can just see it in your mind's eye, can't you? You've got disciples here. You've got this early church here. One of them asked the Apostle John, John, we heard that at that last supper you were, you were reclining upon Jesus' chest. Can you tell us more about the love of Jesus to us? Or maybe one of them would say to Peter, Peter, we heard that in the moment of trial that you turned your back on Jesus and nevertheless you're here today. Can you teach us about the forgiveness and the the reconciliation of Jesus and just on and on and on and on this teaching would go. Can you imagine sitting in some of these sermons where Peter and the other apostles are there teaching and preaching Christ from the Old Testament? They're showing how he is the one that had to take the throne of David, that he is the one that was with Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego in that furnace, that he is the one that kept the hand of Abraham back from sacrificing his son to become the sacrifice for us. The apostles brought out treasures of Christ from things both new and old that people would see Jesus, and we can only obtain this true portrait of our Lord through truly knowing his word and the doctrine contained therein. Listen to this. One time, among many times, the Jews were persecuting Jesus. Remember how I told you a while ago that some people would just write about anything? Here's a case of it. Jesus was healing people on the Sabbath. He was causing the lame to walk again, the blind to see, the deaf to hear. And wouldn't you know, somebody had a problem with it. And they come and they're, they're griping about how it's not lawful to work on the Sabbath. It's amazing. They totally missed the fact that this guy has just healed these people. But they wanted to protect their own tradition and their man-made rules. So they're griping about him. They're harping about him. They've got a real issue with all of this going on. And they begin to hear him. They begin to right now because he says he is the Son of God. And what that does is it equates Jesus as being equal to God. They didn't like it. So Jesus tells them. He's got four witnesses that testify to who he is. And those four witnesses are the Holy Spirit, testifies about him. The works that he himself has done testify about him. John the Baptist testified about him, saying that he is the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. And then he says the word 
the Bible testifies of him that he is the Messiah. And he is the promised one. He tells them these words. He says, you pour over the scriptures because you think you have eternal life in them, yet they testify about me. All scripture is a testimony to Christ. And Christ is the fulfillment of the scripture. You cannot have Christ without the scripture. And you are not looking at the scripture right if it does not reveal to you Christ. Adrian Rogers once said that Jesus Christ cannot be divided from the biblical revelation that is testimony to him. We must not claim knowledge of Christ that is independent of scripture or in any way opposed. Description. And that's why I, brothers and sisters, just seek to be so fervently, radically, obstinately, madly biblical in everything we do. Listen, I take this so serious. That I would ask you to please have the backbone to do me the favor that if I ever get up here and don't speak the word of God, please be merciful enough to me to come that day with a pink slip and say, we no longer need you here. We need a man that will give us the word of God. Be merciful to my soul. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. Now that's for me. Sunday school teacher, you you willing to take that same that same liability? Sunday school director, ministry leader, kids leader, youth leader, anybody that's teaching anybody here. Will you take that as well? That if we find out you are meeting without opening the word of God, we're going to remove you from that mercifully so that the word of God can get to the people. Because here's the thing. We can't know Christ without it. Amen. And if we're not here knowing Christ, just pack it up, leave your Bibles in the pew, and go to the house. There's no need for us to be here if we aren't knowing God. And that comes through his Word. Friends, we will starve without it. Does not the Bible say we do not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God? We know God and the power of His presence only to the end that the word is rightly divided and taught among us. Now, Let's transition here to seeing also that being devoted to doctrine will protect us from error. And we are not immune. Yeah. It will protect us from error. The Bible tells us in Ephesians 4 that God has given the church apostles, prophets, pastors, and teachers for the training of the saints in the work of ministry to build up the body of Christ until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of God's Son, growing into a mature man with a stature measured by Christ's fullness. That's what Paul's saying. That God has invested the teachers of his word, the givers of his word, in the church so that we will all be built up into mature believers in Christ. Here's the end of that. So that we will no longer be little children tossed by the waves and blown around by every wind of teaching by human cunning with cleverness and the techniques of deceit. What God just told you there is that there's a lot of people around us that are a whole lot slicker than we are. And they're smoother. They're silver-tongued up. And they can deceive you to buy just about anything they are selling. Had a visit with a lady this week. 
she expressed to me when I asked her, have you ever committed your life to following Jesus? Have you ever repented of your sin and put faith in Jesus? And her answer was refreshingly honest. She said, I don't believe in that stuff anymore. Well, that got my interest. So I asked about it. And come to find out, the problem was her dog had died. Her husband had got dementia, so she quit believing. In other words, she was believing not for Christ, but for her own earthly comfort. But, she said, and I don't really know why, but she said, when I was younger, I was baptized by the Church of Christ. And I said, I don't guess that baptism did a whole lot of good to you because you're not believing now. It didn't regenerate your heart, did it? And we talked, and it was amazing. We could talk about the end times. She fully agreed with the Bible. We could talk about all of that except for Jesus. She wasn't going to get back on board with him. Strange things. What had happened there? Somebody had deceived her. And from that deception, she deceived herself. The reason, friends, that we need to be ruthlessly biblical and to know God in truth, to be protected from error, is because the time will come when they will not tolerate sound doctrine. In other words, the time's moving quick that uh, I, won't, I won't be able to do this like we're doing now. But according to their own desires, they will accumulate teachers for themselves because they have an itch to hear something new. Something new. As if there's anything new under the sun. My daughter was talking to me last week. She was having a conversation with one of her friends, and the conversation was about homosexuality. And uh, my daughter, of course, takes the biblical position on it, but her friend saw something new available through it. And she said to my daughter that this is the year 2017. Homosexuality is okay. In other words, if time goes on long enough, just about any sin will go. Now, don't get me wrong, that's true. I mean, there's some of you living here that the stuff that's happening in our society today, you know, your, you and your family would have choked on your peas at supper if it was happening then. So I get that point, but her friend was saying it is okay now because we live in their era. God's word doesn't apply to us now, in other words. Now consider this kid growing up without a life-changing, born-again experience to Jesus Christ. Suppose she wants to be religious. And she comes to the Baptist church. And the Baptist preacher there, in no way, shape, or form, will allow the idea that homosexuality will ever be okay because God has said it is not okay. So this isn't the place for her with that doctrine. So she goes and she finds friends and they accumulate for themselves a teacher that will say it is okay. So you've got this crunchy old baddest preacher, you know, losing his hair, overweight, not cool, not hip, not fantastic or anything, but he's staying on God's word. But this other person is teaching them everything they want to hear. And they stay there. And it seems right. And of course they do it all in love. But everybody knows they're all about love. Take on the other hand, let's go back a few years here to the feminist movement. The feminist movement not only wanted a, a type of equality between men and women, which there is because we are both created in God's image, but it also wanted a superiority of females to males. 
This is when we started seeing females take the pulpit and begin to teach men in wholesale. And some of the biggest female preachers today preach to congregations full of men. Now, let me ask you this. We won't get into the Greek with this. I think we can do this in the English. 1 Timothy 2.12, Paul, an apostle of Christ. I do not allow a woman to teach a man. Anything vague about that? Does everybody here get that? We are not to do that. That is against our Lord. It cannot happen. It cannot continue to happen. And the woman down at the Baptist church, she stands for that. And she says, yes, that is right. That's not the way it should be. But the others go on right with it. So what's going to come of this? What's going to happen? Friends, listen, there are so many attacks. There's so much pressure for us to let our grip on the Bible go out like the sun sets for night to come in. We need to take heart. We need to take heart, dear Christian, because the day of judgment comes. And on that day, that old Baptist preacher that stood against homosexuality, he's going to stand before his maker and hear the words, well done, my good and faithful servant. That Baptist lady at the Baptist church, that stood on the word of God, she's going to stand before her Lord and hear those words, welcome to the kingdom prepared for you before the foundations of the earth was laid. Amen. A reward is coming for those who will stand on this word, and that has to be me, and it has to be you. And don't ever let ourselves be deceived by thinking the arms of Christ will be open to those who did not obey his word. Jesus even said, if you not, if you love me, you will keep my commands. May it never be said of us that we are the people who strive to this. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Don't let that be you. Don't let it be me. Let us stand on the word of God. And now let's see here thirdly, that devoting ourselves to right doctrine will give us the right pattern of or for our lives. The Bible tells us in 2 Timothy 3.16 that all scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness so that the man of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. My brothers and sisters, I don't know if this describes you, but I have found times in my life that I have been praying to know the will of God with a Bible three feet from my hands. Do you see the problem with this? Lord, what would you have me to do? Well, he'd probably start by saying, open that book. How am I supposed to raise my children, Lord? Open the book. Read it. How am I supposed to know how to handle this terrible co-worker I'm with? Open the book. We often act like God's given us this word here, but that really doesn't apply to our lives. You've got to be careful of that or you become a practical atheist. It applies to us in all things and in all ways. It's the book. It's in the book, not in our thoughts, that we find God's will for us and how he wants us to order our lives. Sin calls out to us so very loudly. But by devoting ourselves to the word, we still hear that small voice that cuts through all the clutter and all the rubbish of the world around us to care the Lord that we might restrain our feet from evil, that we might keep the life word. We often don't know what to do, but this we know for sure. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Amen. We should be sponges that soak up the water of God's word to the point that we are transformed and our minds are renewed to live life totally for Christ. As we sang earlier, it's his word 
that is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path, but that not that we walk in darkness. And now lastly, by devoting ourselves to the apostles' doctrine, we will find that the word points us to heaven. In the book of Colossians, Paul tells us that he was praying for them because he had heard about their faith in Christ Jesus and the love which you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven of which you previously heard in the word of truth, the gospel. That's the connection between this life and our hope of heaven. And that connection is our devotion to God's word. His word reminds us that all that we do and all we are called to give up and all we are called to sacrifice and all we learn from him will never be in vain because he has put us on a journey with the destination of heaven. We have direction through doctrine, you see. C.S. Lewis tells about a British Royal Air Force officer who once told him that he had no time for doctrine or theology. And the officer went on to explain, he said, I have no use for all that stuff, but mind you, I'm a religious man too. Interesting. He said, I know there's a God. Yes, so does Satan. I felt him out alone in the desert at night, the tremendous mystery. And that's just why I don't believe all your neat little dogmas and formulas about him. To anyone who's met the real thing, they all seem so pity and pedantic and unreal. Man, that sounds spiritual, doesn't it? I'm so spiritual, I don't even need doctrine to know the great mystery of God. But C.S. Lewis sees it another way. He says that doctrines and theology and the apostles' teaching are like a map. Merely learning and thinking about the Christian doctrines, if you stop there, says Lewis, is less real and less exciting than the sort of thing my friend got in the desert. Doctrines are not God. They are kind of a map that leads us to understand him and to know him. The doctrines of God's word do lead us somewhere. They lead us right into the heart. Jesus Christ. And being in him, we have the destination of heaven and the hope of it forever with him, just like the Colossians had. Jesus once said, listen carefully. He said, this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have seen. Would you bow with me for just a moment in prayer? Friend, today, I don't know where you are at in your spiritual journey, but I urge you to look and see. Maybe you're one of these that believes God exists, but you, you don't really know him because you haven't seen him through his word. And I want to ask you today, dear friend, if this is the day that you need to repent, to turn from your sin, and to turn to Christ by faith and follow him. And dear Christian, I want us to all examine ourselves now and ask ourselves, are we living a ruthlessly radical, biblical life in accordance to the terms of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? If you have something that you need to give to him today, like your life or repentance, then do that. And take up his word and go forth, living it out. Let's pray.